Hello and welcome to WJTS Inform. It's time for our weekly visit with State Legislator Mark Mesmer for District 63. Mark, welcome to the studio. Good, good afternoon. Good to be here. Well, we're going to talk to you about uh, some bills that went through this week, but we're also going to talk about the surveys that you take and mm -hmm. do they really have value. Uh, but before we start, we do want to let folks know that tomorrow morning at 8.30 at the Vincennes University Jasper Campus Lecture Hall, which is the second newest building on campus, mm -hmm. uh, there will be the legislative breakfast by the Jasper Chamber of Commerce and VUJC. And that starts at 8.30. It's open to the public. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you Invite and you. Uh, Lloyd Arnold. Hume and Lloyd Arnold yep. and Richard Young mm -hmm. will be there to, mm -hmm. to speak. So you're, you're invited to come. All right, Mark. Uh, first of all, let's talk about some bills that, that you've been working on that have gone through the House this week. Okay. I had two bills that had committee hearings this week. Uh, one was voted out. The other one will be voting on Tuesday. Um, one was the one that voted out of uh, the um, Local Government Reform Committee was uh, setting up the Office of Entrepreneurship in the Lieutenant Governor's Office. Over the past few years, we've passed a variety of bills dealing with ways to help support entrepreneurism in the state, setting up entrepreneurs and programs in our colleges, uh, some small business programs that, that, that had been really housed in different uh, parts of state government. And we're going to pull all those into one focused entity called the Office of Entrepreneurship that operates under the Lieutenant Governor's Office. And they, she had part of, the, uh, part of the responsibility of dealing with some of those programs before. Some of them were higher, some were in higher ed, some were, were in Indiana Economic Development Corporation, some were in the Office of Community and Rural Affairs. So we're going to bring those under one focused uh, spot under the ombudsman of the Office of Entre Entrepreneurship and really be able to, to focus them and be, be more effective at helping make in Indiana you know, a, a great place for people that want to start a new business. Okay, and so that has gone that, out of the House. I, it voted out of committee, the 12 committee, to nothing. Okay. It'll be on the floor next week. It's, it's up for amending on Monday. I don't anticipate any amendments to be filed on the floor, so it'll have its uh, amendment process available Monday, Tuesday. It'll be voted on in, in the uh, final passage, and it was unanimous in the committee. I would expect, you know, unanimous on the floor, okay. and we'll send it to the Senate. Uh, another bill that I had a hearing on was the uh, farm wineries bill. We had heard the bill in public policy last year, voted it out of our committee, voted it out of the House, got kind of stalled in the Senate. They decided they want to have it sent to a summer study committee. It got sent to my summer study committee on economic development where we heard we heard about a half an hour to 45 minutes of testimony last year in, in committee. We heard about four hours of testimony in summer study committee and out of summer study committee we had a unanimous between the House Republicans, uh, Democrat, Senate Republican, Democrat, all the business folks that are on that, you know, the 12 people that make up that study committee unanimous con uh, approval by the, by the Summer Study Committee that our current policy dealing with farm wineries, uh, not allowing them to sell any of their product directly to retailers or you know, restaurants, bars, um, grocery stores in their community that have, you know, that have alcohol permits. Mm -hmm. uh, currently there's a prohibition of, of selling anything locally other than they can sell it at their, you know, at their winery but they can't sell it directly to retailers. And uh, House Bill 1387 would allow them to have a 5,000 gallon limit of being able to distribute that product locally. Uh, unanimous consent last summer that our current policy is, is hurting the wine industry in our state. I mean, they've had some growth, but it's been strictly due to the wine tourism mm -hmm. program that the state supports. Purdue helps advertise the state you know, farm wine industry. And they've developed a pretty good tourism business but their hands are really cuffed on, on you know, being able to grow to the point where working with a traditional wholesaler or there's another program called a micro wholesaler that you can set up with you know, another third party. I mean, it's, it's basically two levels of wholesaling that are, that are out there for them. But when you're only selling you know, three to five to maybe 8,000 gallons of wine a year, the cost associated with that wholesale mechanism compared to the margins on a $10 bottle of wine, that wholesaler has about $2.50 to work with to make that transfer of that product um, pay for itself. Mm -hmm. $2, $2.50 a bottle um, just doesn't, it doesn't give them enough margin based on the volume. The wholesalers all testified this week that they lose money trying to deal with farm wineries. All of them lose money. The micro wholesaler 
permit is too expensive for small sized wineries. It works good for large wineries, uh, but it, it's not utilized by farm wineries uh, you know, that are in the startup. Our current system, the winery loses money in the process of working through a wholesaler. The wholesaler loses money working through the process of, of using a wholesaler. If both of them are losing money in the process, it's time to make some changes. And, and summer, okay. Yep, Summer Study Committee agreed to that. Uh, we heard, heard the bill in, in committee again this week. All the testimony was even more wholesalers came to testify that they all lose money in trying to work with farm wineries. Unless you're the size of Oliver mm -hmm. or Easley or French Lick. And those really big wineries, the reason they got so big is they, they went through all of their growth prior to the change in 2006 when they could no longer uh, self-distribute any of their product. So it was an overreaction to our court case in 2006. They thought they had you know, a system set up that might, might work. It's just not working. So uh, expect it to move out of committee next Tuesday and, and we'll uh, hopefully it fares a little better in the Senate next, uh, the second half of the session. Those are my two bills. And then we had a couple of pretty good bills come through Economic Development Study Committee. Uh, one was House Bill 1020 that was uh, authored by Representative Cook that, that requires analysis, a five-year rolling analysis of all of our tax incentives, every tax incentive, whether it's state tax incentive, property tax incentives, and, 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 and review each of those you know, every year, you know, look at 20% of them, go through a couple of cycles of that, and then see what value we, we garner from that. Another pretty good bill that came through my committee was House Bill 1003, and that is uh, taking the, the uh, process we started last year of, of looking at workforce development issues and making sure students are getting education that matches the job needs of today and that workers are getting retrained uh, you know, quickly to better match the job skills that are out there. So just a advance on the ball a little farther you know, from where we were uh, last year, it sets up a little bit more statistical analysis, you know, some framework on how to, you know, to analyze data in, in the, in the, you know, out in the, in the workplace and, and in the consumer side of things, matching it up with, with, you know, the things that are being offered in schools. And so it's, it's just inching the ball down the field a little bit more on that issue and, 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 and you know, pretty important impact, I think. It, that one passed out of the committee 12 to 1, the, uh, the economic development study bill uh, passed out of committee and then actually we passed it out of the you know out of the floor uh, unanimously as well so that one's off to the Senate. Uh, there was 20 bills to in total that have been uh, passed through to the Senate all of them bipartisan uh, most of them unanimous none of them have been straight party line votes and, and I think I've found in the past that's true of about 98 percent of the stuff that we deal with in the legislature. A high degree of it is, is uh, bipartisan uh, and a high degree of them are, are usually unanimous. So you know, we do tend to work together pretty well. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you send out surveys, mm -hmm. uh, all, as, as all legislators do, and you get the results back. And, mm -hmm. uh, do they really make a difference and what are some things that you have found out? Well, they make a big difference to me and, and usually I'm, I'm, I don't think I've ever been surprised by a survey question. Um, most of the time, you know, because I'm try to stay in touch with my constituents anyway, I, I've got a pretty good feel for for what you know the you know what issues are important to the folks in my district. But whenever I know or have a pretty good sense that there's going to be legislation coming up, you know, dealing with an issue, I try to send out you know and put that on my survey. Uh, it doesn't always show up in a piece of legislation that year, uh, but normally it does. And and so I try to try to get the the feel for what's important to my district and. I have never voted contrary to, I mean, if I had a survey that was strongly in support of an issue or strongly against an issue, I have always voted the way the district uh, would, have, would have wanted me to vote on these surveys. So these surveys will make a difference to they you. Do. They do. Uh, and, and you've got some interesting results on some of the things, like uh, on the Core 40, I think? Yeah, the uh, Common Core. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really been debated in, in, in the legislature the last couple of years pretty briskly. Uh, this last year we put a moratorium on on continuing to roll out common core and uh, the governor's come out pretty well you know strongly against you know full adoption of it I think a lot of states uh, 
entered into it, and a lot of them are, you know, some of them have, have retracted that. But I asked, you know, should we just, should we as a state pick what we like out of, out of Common Core rather than adopt all of it? Uh, and, you know, pick what we like, pick what we think works best, and implement it. And 73% of the people in my district said that they, they agreed that that's the right way to approach the, you know. There's parts of Common Core that the teachers that have adopted it think works really well. And it, it rolled out in kindergarten, first grade a couple of years ago. They said some of it is just not possible for kids. They're just not, it's just not age, um, age specific, you know, matched to what a kid's mental ability is at that age. Well, if we adopt Common Core and we've got to adopt the testing standards that go along with Common Core, and that becomes our benchmark for, you know, for our, our kids learning properly. Well, if, you know, if we're forced to adopt parts that we, you know, don't think are, are age appropriate or, or the right content for our kids, you know, we're just setting ourselves up for down the road, you know, other education standards problems. So, 73 percent. Oh no, sorry. Um, yeah, 73 percent thought that uh, we need to just pick what we like and pick what we know works best from that standard and, and then and adopt our own standards. So happy with that. And there is a bill that may be coming out about uh, owning a gun, having mm -hmm. a handgun uh, and, and the permit or where that gun is kept when you get out of your car. Right. There's a, we've corrected a lot of the, you know, a lot of the um, inconsistency in, in, in gun laws across the state the last few years. One that still remains, if you're a licensed gun, you know, handgun permit holder, if you take your kid to school, you can have the gun on your possession, drive your kid through the parking lot, drop your child off, um, and, and, they, and, and you can leave the property and, and you, are, you are covered by Indiana law currently. But if for any reason you've got to, you know, the principal flags you down in the parking lot or says, you know, says, hey, come and, and talk to me about something or you've got to drop something off to the office, Currently in Indiana, if you lock that handgun in your vehicle, out of sight, glove compartment, uh, console, whatever, lock your car, the minute you leave that car, you're committing a felony in Indiana. Uh, and House Bill 1018 would, would allow you, if you're a licensed handgun carrier, to, in that situation, lock it out of sight and lock your vehicle and, and, then, and then enter the school property without, without committing a felony. There's a couple other nuances in that, in that school zone. There's also a thing called a roaming school zone that's part of Indiana law that you could be a, a licensed handgun permit holder, be at a zoo. A school takes a field trip. Okay. That zoo now becomes a school zone. You could be there legally, students enter the property, you're not committing a felony because that roaming school zone has now made that non-school property school property. So, some very unusual things in our in situation our we never really thought we'd have to deal with. Right. Now we, we deal right. with it. Right. Yeah. So, what, the House Bill 1018 was heard in committee last week. Uh, well, it, it's planned on being voted out of committee uh, on Tuesday to just correct some things that are really, um, uh, you know, inconsistencies in our gun laws. And on that one, I should have, uh, that one had 85% approval to, to take that felony issue away from somebody who, who is, a, now you can't enter a school's building, you know, with a gun currently, this makes no change to that. Okay. It, you know, that's still a felony, you still would be permitted from, uh, from doing that. Now, also, a lot of people, health care is on their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, should Indiana expand their uh, Medicare or Medicaid? Medicaid. Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, what are your findings there, and and will we see bills on this? Uh, well, last year we had a we had a bill that that we we processed that um, we did not allow Indiana to expand the Medicaid coverage um, for you know the federal government says under Medi uh, under Obamacare they want. They want all states to expand, or part of Obamacare is you were supposed to expand your Medicaid to 138% of poverty level. Take poverty level times two, times another 38%. You know, you know, take current Medicaid enrollment and more than double the income, you know, almost two and a half times the current level. Uh, projections are that there's uh, 400,000 Hoosiers who would be 
picked up under that scenario and, and enrolled in Medicaid uh, at the cost, the 10-year cost for that uh, projections are, are $2 billion you know, to the state of Indiana. That's based on a projection of 400,000 Hoosiers that would qualify. It doesn't take into account over the next year as you see uh, the cost of medical insurance for employers continue to rise. Many of those people who are currently insured are going to be uninsured. It's just, it's happening across the country on, uh, you know, on individual insurance and, and, and it's going to continue, you know, on business sponsored plans. That $2 billion is based on that 400,000 enrollment number if we expanded it. Uh, my personal expectations is that that number would be probably 800,000 and 4 billion. So 67% uh, of the folks to the, uh, the respondent said, we don't want to expand Medicaid coverage. Leave it as is. Okay. Uh, anything else that you'd like to discuss that, that came on the survey? Um, well, one of the things that really confirmed my, you know, from what I had uh, heard on the, on the farm winery uh, bill, 74% mm -hmm. of, of the respondents said, you know, yes, we need to uh, loosen the, you know, the uh, restrictions on the alcohol distribution and, and uh, you, know, let, you know, allow the farm wineries to have some, some direct retail uh, ability. Um, Fifty-nine percent said they they would approve, you know, approved of allowing Indiana farm wineries and Indiana microbreweries uh, to sell some of the product at the state fair. So there's been there's been some interest in that the last few years to to move that. It's never gotten very far, but I know there's a piece of legislation uh, coming for that. And uh, one that has I've surveyed uh, several years prior. This is probably the highest response I've gotten. It should would should would require some level of drug testing for uh, for welfare beneficiaries. Ninety one percent said you know yes that's something we need to do. Two years in a row for sure maybe three we've passed a bill out of the house uh, uh, and and gotten it to the Senate. Last year it came really really close to, to final passage in the Senate as well. Um, but ninety one percent of of the folks in our district think we need to to have some drug testing mechanism in place for folks who receive welfare. Will we see a bill to mm -hmm. that effect yep. this year? Yep. So it'll probably come out of the House and then it'll sit in the Senate again? Well, we'll have to wait and see. it came pretty close last year. It probably wasn't actually a uh, issue with this specific this specific bill last year on, on drug testing, but there's it, it, it's kind of funny how somebody who's not getting their way on another bill during conference committee last year wouldn't sign the conference committee report this year. So there was, somebody was just being stubborn. So it just stopped. And so right it stopped there. at okay. the right at the <clears throat> inches from the finish line last year. So uh, it, it two years ago it got it got stopped in committee. Last year in the Senate it got out of committee, got you know got changed a little bit along the way. Went to conference committee, and then they just couldn't couldn't iron out the differences for uh, not exactly the sure the reason you know who, who wouldn't uh, who wouldn't cooperate, but it it just missed the final tweak last year. We'll make one more push this year. All right. Well, Mark, thank you very much for coming in. You're welcome. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Yep. Hope to see you tomorrow as well. This is WJTS Inform. We are local people watching local people.